One of the most infamous science fiction box office bombs, and certainly one of the most ambitious, is David Lynch's film adaptation of Frank Herbert's influential novel, Doom. Over the years, it has been reassessed, and while some have expressed fondness for it, it's still regarded as a mess harmed by cuts and trying to cram as much world building into one movie as possible. And the truth is, as much as I admire Dune and do enjoy it, it's not hard to see why the critics didn't take to it. But first, let's go into a brief history. In 1965, the book Dune was published. It was a massive success among science fiction fans. Not surprisingly, Hollywood came a calling with producer Arthur P. Jacobs of Planet of the Apes fame being the first to buy the film rights. He sat on them for a while, and then died. Then, a pair of French producers bought the rights and hired avant-garde filmmaker Alejandro Jodorowsky to direct it. Millions were spent on concept art, and the script ended up being longer than the phone book. Eventually, finances ran out, and this project became one of the most infamous unmade movies, enough that a great documentary called Jodorowsky's Doom was made that goes into just about every detail about what could have been. When Dino De Laurentiis bought the rights, he asked Ridley Scott to direct it, and while the script was being written and the artwork was being designed, Scott had to bow out due to personal reasons. Eventually, David Lynch hot off the success of The Elephant Man, and having just turned down an offer from George Lucas to direct Return of the Jedi, got the job of bringing Dune to the screen. One trouble production shoot in Mexico, and Lynch being forced to edit down his three-hour cut, later, Doom premiered, and as is well known, flopped. In this defense, I'm going to talk about not only what I like about Dune, but also explore precisely why audiences and critics were turned off by it. At this point, I would describe the plot, but it's difficult to do that in simplistic terms, which shows the trouble Lynch had when trying to adapt Doom. There are a lot of characters, terminology, and history going on here, but for me, that's kind of a part of its charm. This feels like a lived-in future world, and the political maneuvering and conflict between the families is one with clearly a lot of history. It's also why I recommend watching the prologue from the longer television cut before watching Dune, as I think it does a better job of explaining the conflict at hand and the history of the four planets better than the introduction with Virginia Madsen. I think the development of the main character, Paul Atreides, does a decent job of pulling me in. He goes through a major arc, from wanting the all-powerful spice from the planet Arrakis for his own family, to wanting to cease production of it, and it's fascinating seeing his change to Freedom Fighter. The main villain, Baron Harkonnen, is where Lynch goes the most gruesome, something that was criticized on the original release, but I think it fits the character of a sleazeball so dependent on the spice, which is the equivalent of an addictive drug, and Kenneth McMillan is clearly having a ball in the role. Throughout Dune, we see backstabbing, changing alliances, and a war getting bleaker and bleaker. Another great concept presented in the world building is the Sandworms, which were adapted for the screen by Carlo Rambaldi, the same man who put E.T. together. These gigantic things prove a real threat to gaining the spice, but also work in developing Paul and his full transition into a Freeman. I really like the overall look of Dune, and I have to give credit to production designer Anthony Masters, who makes each planet look unique and distinct. The Hakonan's home planet of Gaidi Prime is especially imposing and truly adds to the sick nature of the Baron. The score by 1980's rock band Toto also adds to the atmospheric quality of Dune. One unusual device used in the film that I don't think entirely works is the inclusion of voiceover as characters randomly spout inner monologues about the situation. This clearly exists to provide more information to the audience, but it all feels superfluous and distracting. Additional narration by Princess Irulan occasionally pipes in to fill in gaps in the story and explain things to the viewer. That's the tricky part of taking such a dense novel like Dune and packing it into a studio-mandated runtime. It makes me wonder if splitting the book into two parts would have been better, but that's a practice more common now than it was in the 1980s, and Dune was already expensive enough as it was. Looking back at the critical reception at the time, 
Dune was mostly derided for being confusing, as it tried to cram in so much history and world building into one film, and not doing enough to bring an outside audience into its universe. It's amazing uh, how arrogant they were in thinking that they didn't have to tell any story at all, and then it's amazing that, that then they throw in the narration. It starts out with the actress Virginia Madsen on right. screen, and she's saying, these are a few things you need to know about my father and about these four planets <laughs> right. and about the worms and so forth. And you're saying, wait a minute, I'd rather be confused and not know anything than be confused by the explanation. Yeah. I sat there, you may have heard me, five minutes into this film, I yelled out at the screen, I give up. I was, and then I had to watch the rest of it. I and even as I stand here defending the film, I completely understand. Dune is the kind of film that either works for you, or it doesn't. And I don't mean that in a, well, you just don't get it way. I had a similar experience with Warcraft this summer that critics in 1984 had with Dune. As I sat there and tried to follow along, as the film threw all sorts of settings, monsters, and character names and motivations, I grew frustrated at how overly complicated it was, and I had trouble getting emotionally invested in it. However, there were people who were more enthralled by Warcraft and had an easier time getting absorbed in the world and mythos, not unlike what has happened to Dune in the subsequent years since its release, and the adoration towards it grew. I also think part of why it didn't resonate with audiences at the time was that people's expectations for a big-budget science fiction epic was something more along the lines of Star Wars. I love Star Wars, but part of its widespread appeal is its ability to take classic tropes and present them in a way that's simplistic and its basic themes of good versus evil have an easy universal appeal. George Lucas even took some inspiration from Dune when making Star Wars. The planet of Tatooine definitely owes a lot to the desert planet Arrakis, as does Luke Skywalker becoming a respected leader for the Rebel Alliance. Dune is anything but simple, and there's a lot more to comprehend as we follow its set of characters and their multiple agendas. There's a lot to unravel in Dune as a result. I can also understand somebody watching Dune and finding it too campy and ridiculous. After all, this is a film where Sting, yes, that Sting, suddenly appears wearing winged underwear. Hey, Lynch originally wanted him to be completely in the buff, but then the producers were like, yeah, no, put some underpants on him. It's also definitely a product of the 80s, and I think that's a decade that's probably easier to swallow for some than for others. Then there's the fact that this is a David Lynch film. Even though he has distanced himself from it, it still fits in neatly with the rest of his filmography, in its usage of weird and often surreal imagery. A scene in which Paul's younger sister is born in a pool of blood is straight out of the Lynch wheelhouse. To conclude, while I like Dune, it makes complete sense why somebody would watch it and react with, what was that all about? That's certainly how many in 1984 and even the heads of Universal Pictures felt while watching it. And I say this as somebody who hasn't even read the book. So my enjoyment of it doesn't even come from being familiar with the source material. I think you should give Dune a watch and decide for yourself how you feel about it. Whether you love or hate it, you'll certainly find quite a lot to discuss. See you next time.